round and be a bit informal. I'm a bit trapped by the microphone. Just to check, uh, can you hear me okay? Is it coming out all right? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. It's great to be here. I've been involved in the, <coughs> sort of, they asked me months ago, I've been involved a bit in the planning and, <coughs> wow, the day's finally arrived. Um, I think I, I came over two or three weeks ago in the heat wave. Do you remember the heat wave? <laughs> Hang on to the heat wave from memory. There will be another one next year. Okay, um, so here we go, um, sort of scene setting tonight. Um, probably first, first off I'll try and make you really gloomy uh, and then try and pick you up from there. That's a bit of where we're going. Um, before I make you gloomy, this is just a, a question really uh, to hold somewhere. Uh, in your mind over the, over the weekend. It is brilliant to see so many people giving up whole or part of a weekend for this conference and that in itself signifies a, a lot about your motivation and, uh, and the sort of Christians you are. Um, but uh, sometimes, you know, I have been a vicar of churches over many years, it, it does seem as though some Christians want church life to centre on supplying them with what they need or want. Whether it's the music they like, the worship style they prefer, the social life, the things that feed them and make them feel good. Uh, and uh, church is going to have, you know, issues about that. We, we like this, we like that, we fight for our corner. Other Christians want church to be a community in which together we live and work to Jesus' praise and glory. And that's what we're about this weekend. Inevitably, if we have that attitude, that involves sacrifice. And it is because it involves a desire to help other people find and grow in the faith. And that might conflict with the things that make us feel comfortable and good. Uh, so... Deep down, what sort of Christian are you? Is the sort of question. The answer with all of us probably is we've got elements of both those things inside of us. Uh, so, um, this weekend I'm just suggesting what we're doing is focusing on, the, on that positive side of us or how together we can live and work to Jesus' praise and glory uh, and help others to find and grow in the Christian faith. Deep motivation. Looking, looking into ourselves. Mm. Um, vision and hope. That's an encouraging title. Uh, but uh, let's... Uh, if, if, by the way, I met quite a few of you in January, didn't I, when we came to... I still haven't learned how to handle the glasses. If you, you've noticed that. I might just put them on one side for a moment because it's quite big print here, so I might be all right. Um, this is what people say some of the stuff people say about our changing world our changing culture uh, and how it has become harder for the Christian church to thrive, grow, attract new generations share the good news uh, with us around as we move from what we think of as modernity to post-modernity uh, and uh, here are some elements of, of what that suggests. Uh, in post-modernity, um, I don't receive somebody else's story, I tell my own. Uh, in post-modernity, I choose my beliefs. Those I inherit from my culture, uh, I can accept or reject. I choose my beliefs, I'm in charge. And I buy my identity. You know, I don't see too many you know, designer jeans here in the room today, but you know what I mean. You know, you, the, the clothes you buy identify you, the music you listen to, you purchase your identity in the world. Uh, there's a sort of logic about consumerism there. Uh, and uh, of course I'm a modern, because I'm elderly, uh, so, as far as I'm concerned, um, on the left hand side there you see, truth is fact. It's a factual thing. For instance, you know, for me, the key thing about the Christian faith, is it true, historically, that Jesus rose from the dead? 
and that's actually coming to the conclusion that probably was true was how I became a Christian uh, oh dear uh, 45 or 50 years ago um, uh, but uh, in post-modernity uh, oh, truth claims facts oh, very slippery things people make uh, conflicting claims uh, we assess truth through experience so what's the experience like uh, and that dictates that's a, that's a different sort of idea of truth so that's just a picture just you know, contrasting modernity and post-modernity and the sort of changing way people's minds seem to work here's a few aspects of what we call postmodern culture we pick and mix you might, you might, by the way, you know, um, identify. You know, ooh, some of these things, you know, we, even a modern of my age sort of picks up from the cultures we go along. Um, some of it uh, is, is is another world to some of us. Uh, certainly, we're more suspicious of tradition and authority. At least we thought we were until last weekend, when we all celebrated our uh, creed. Yeah. So it's complicated, isn't it? Yeah no longer believes in the idea of progress, refuses to judge, you know. Well, if, if that's okay for you, that's fine, you know. I, I, my set of values are different, but you know, you're entitled to yours, so I'm not going to judge you. Uh, boundaries are fuzzy. I'm not quite sure that's always true about individualism, but it's just my attempt to, you know, paint a bit of a picture. The isms. What are we into? Materialism. I shop, therefore I am. Hedonism, individualism, voyeurism, yeah. uh, what we watch other people live rather than live ourselves. Soap operas, Big Brother, sport, porn, news. It's, it's uh, what a lot of us do. Pluralism, everything is equally valid. And escapism into privatised living. Uh, in a world that just war comes at us from every direction we, we, it's a funny thing, we absorb more information from the outside world than ever it's the information age uh, but in a way that makes some people want to just escape from it into their private world and what about our, our, the image problem that you may have noticed the church has a slight image problem these days uh, these are some of the things we're accused of being uh, you know that's pretty common you know as soon as General Sinner gets up and, and debates women bishops and sex and other such things you know we're just institutional inward looking we're not doing you know caring for society we're irrelevant ordinary life passes us by um, we're shrinking tiny unimportant let's forget them we're elderly um, it, this is something I've discovered by the way um, <laughs> Uh, through, through um, you know what's coming here, don't you? Um, through, well, speaking of conferences of Christians, uh, uh, we used to be called the Tory party at prayer, well that's no longer particularly true. Um, but I have discovered this, this link, that most Anglicans are also members of the National Trust. <laughs> now, uh, here we are. Now, you may be totally different round here, I don't know. Uh, but could you own up? Which of you is a member? Have you, have you ever, are you now, or have you ever been a member of the National Trust? Could you put your hand up? <laughs> Yay! That's it. Yes? <laughs> I didn't hear that. What did he say? I'm a member of the English Heritage, that's why I'm a member of the <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. Yes. Yes, okay. So I'll suss you lot out. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in addition to that, of course, we are dull, we are boring and stiff and starchy killjoys, uh, because lots of the things that people think are, are great we apparently disapprove of. Um, intellectually weak, of course, you know, there's plenty of. That, that around, of course, we're torn apart by conflict. You know, you get these newspaper headlines all the time. You know, Church of England riven by another conflict, and you think, oh, are we? I didn't really think so, uh, but uh, apparently we are. Uh, oh, and there's, there's plenty more. Yes, some people say, oh, Jesus is interesting. The Church is not. 
We're exploitative and untrustworthy. You know, the paedophile priests done us a lot of harm. Uh, we make truth claims. Therefore, we are narrow-minded and bigoted. Because, you know, we say, this is the truth, we are right. Yeah? Uh, 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 and other stuff is wrong. Uh, so, so we're not live and let live. We're narrow-minded and we're bigoted. We're morally inferior. We used to, uh, people didn't do what we said they ought to when I was young, but at least people got their version of right and wrong from the Christian church. So, you know, the, the, the chap with, or was a chap in those days, the chap with a dog collar um, did, was able to say to the community, this is right and this is, this is wrong, but the community would more or less accept it. Uh, but now we are considered by many people morally inferior to them for some of the above reasons. And of course religion is the cause of conflicts, uh, and, and that, uh, about half the Church of England come under the label of evangelical, and, and that word has, has become very interesting how it's been twisted, it means someone of sinister, dangerous, fundamentalist. You can imagine, you know, the, the, the provisional wing of the Church of England, or you know, Anglican Al-Qaeda, you know. Uh, but, so there we are. Um, this is, this is some, some of the, the image we contend with. And then, of course, later on top of that, people are busy, busy, busy. Um, so a lot of people are neutral about us. They're apathetic. Oh, it's all right. If they want to do that, that's fine. I'm nothing against them. But, but it's not for me, because we, I'm, you know, our life is too busy for that. Sort of thing. It, we're seen as a leisure pursuit, an, an optional leisure pursuit. It's not for me, but it can be for them, and good luck to them. People's lives are stressed and busy, uh, and uh, all this stuff, you know, giving up a weekend for a church conference. Dear, you know, how sad you are. Uh, um, and folk, of course, have much less sense of sin uh, or mortality than they used to. People tend to imagine they're going to live to a hundred. Uh, and uh, if you live that long, of course, you don't really notice when you finally die, because, you know, you gradually fade away, so that's okay. Um, uh, and little sense of sin and needing of forgiveness. Um, uh, and everything's invested in this life uh, rather than the next. So, you know, we have no need of God, or do we? Uh, but there's all this anxiety, whether it's about bereavement or jobs or whatever. How do they handle that? <coughs> so, that's some of the gloom gloom stuff uh, <coughs> that uh, can be pointed at us or you know, is like you swirling around. Um, uh, one thing is for sure, um, <coughs> Christendom uh, as the state of the nation is disappearing or has disappeared. Christendom we've lived in for centuries, uh, the idea that this is a Christian country where um, the church is, is part of the fabric of, of authority and um, Christian morality and ethics um, uh, 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 at the heart of and even imposed upon the nation, uh, we live in this, this Christian or Christianized society, Christendom. Uh, and the, the self understanding of the Church of England was that we were a pastoral church caring for a Christian nation in Christendom. And I think when I was training for ministry 35 years ago, that was, you know, that was the, roughly the idea that people still had. Uh, if it were ever true, it clearly no longer is. Uh, unless we become and are a missionary church to our post-Christian culture, uh, we, we will fade away and die. And that's a huge change from understanding ourselves as a pastoral church caring for a Christian nation to being a missionary church trying to reach a post-Christian culture. Uh, and... Uh, you know, for me to get my head around it, you know, after uh, 50 years as a Christian, is uh, is quite interesting and difficult. Uh, but that's that's I think uh, roughly where we've got to. Uh, so having taken you down, I want to now try and take you up a little bit. If that's all right. Uh, uh, and there's a headline. All this is actually quite promising. Now, why do I say that? 
Um, well, uh, we know that in this changing and challenging uh, culture that we're living through, uh, Jesus still draws people to himself and grows his church because there are, there are huge numbers of Christian churches and, uh, 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 and Anglican churches in this country that are growing. Uh, in fact, um, I don't often uh, give a plug for the Church of England newspaper. In fact, I don't remember ever doing that before in my life. But uh, this week, today, in the Church of England newspaper, is a wonderful article by uh, the chap who edited, has edited a book that I contributed to that's just come out this week, um, which uh, is arguing against the usual hypothesis that the, the church in general in this country is shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. Uh, and demonstrating that actually it's a much more complex picture than that. There's as much growth as there is shrinkage. Uh, and uh, we, we shouldn't swallow the lie that the church is, is, is disappearing, because it ain't. Uh, I can't even remember the title of the book that I've contributed to, uh, so I can't tell you what it is, but I'll look it up. Um, another thing is that for, for most individuals in this country their image of their own local church is much better than their image of the national church. Why? Because they get their image of the national church from the media and they get their image of the local church from, from you, from local Christians. Uh, and, their, and their experience of Christians and churches is much better than, than what they read about. Uh, or see on the telly. Um, uh, uh, and there are lots of grounds for hope if we catch vision. I'm trying to explain what I mean by that. Um, first of all, we have in this country huge numbers of people who are on spirituality searches. Uh, younger generations are far more open to spiritual discussion than my generation ever was. Uh, now, they don't normally immediately think of, of Christianity when they're on spiritual searches, uh, but we know uh, that, that, uh, that Christ is the only destination that will satisfy folk. So, um, we can engage with people on those searches. Uh, and then society is dislocated. Uh, uh, I, I really did grow up in, in, in that wonderful world where you know you didn't need to lock your door and the kids played out in the street uh, and, and you knew all the neighbours and, you know, and there was extended family uh, and uh, we were part of a great community uh, and for many people, most people, that, that, has, that has been destroyed in all sorts of ways. Uh, well, uh, the, the need of human beings for community and belonging has not changed uh, and people who have been dislocated from, from their own natural communities respond especially well to churches that offer healthy, loving community and belonging. Uh, and and that's, um, that's a huge new thing. We used to talk in language when I was young um, about the church I attend. Now we talk about the church I belong to. And you can see why. Um, and many people, of course, uh, will happily belong to this great community before they start believing the message of our faith. And that's great. Uh, 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 folk will come on a journey with us maybe for months and years belong and believe uh, uh, and then um, coming back to where I started um, when we're thinking about truth as fact and truth as experience for people who are looking for something that's true in experience uh, that they're also thinking well what's going to work for me and the answer to that question, will it work for me, is not normally um, hmm, giveable, if that's a word, by the, you know, by the expert at a microphone you know, doing a sermon. Uh, uh, so the, the premium on the, on, the, on the evangelistic sermon proving that Jesus really did for us and the dead is perhaps a bit less than it was, but the premium on personal testimony is much higher. Uh, somebody think, will this work for me? Well the answer is, 
from all of us in our different ways to be able to say, well, it works for me. Uh, you know, here's a story. If it works for me, it might work for you because we're quite similar people. Uh, so there's a, there's a, there's a huge uh, power in personal testimony. Uh, and all the new communications tools, um, I'm glad that you, you had a seminar on Twitter uh, just now. Uh, and uh, I, I always think that people who use Twitter are probably called twits, but I, I, I expect I'm wrong there. They're probably called tweeters or, or something. Yes, I am wrong. Yes, yes, tweeters. Uh, yes, you, you tweet. Um, so maybe the gospel can be tweeted. Uh, uh, and hey, the Church of England has been changing very fast. Uh, I put there more appropriate, appropriate culture in many churches. Uh, we have become more relaxed, less stiff and formal. Uh, we, we have become uh, a, a friendlier bunch of people. Now you, you might not immediately think, I don't know what your church is like, some people are smiling at me, so that's, that's good. But my memory goes back 50 or 60 years now in churches, and I do remember you know, something of what churches were like there. My, my main memories, of course, that need healing are of, of, of enormously large ladies in hats. Uh, who would uh, tut tut and, uh, and, and you know if I made a sound uh, were quite quite capable of clonking me if I made a, a significant sound uh, um, uh, and our culture is is more appropriate uh, than it used to be. Did you know that the membership of the of churches in the diocese of London has gone up ten percent in the last? It should say twenty years that. Um, just to illustrate that this idea, this story of decline, 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 uh, uh, needs is much more complicated than that. If, any, if, if post-modernity has gone furthest anywhere in the country, it's going to be in the capital. Uh, and yet, in the last 20 years, the electoral roll uh, in, the, in the diocese of London has gone up 70 percent. Okay. Um, so let me just take that that sort of. Um, change into postmodernity a bit more. Uh, the is it true question, my question, you know, I'm 63 in next week or the week after, uh, that's answered by an expert, by a book, by a sermon. The does it work question is answered by every Christian saying that it works for me. Uh, but a younger generation, still my, say, my son's generation, he's in, in his mid 20s. Uh, the initial question as they, they tend, you know, work around the edges of the Christian church or faith uh, is like, more likely to be these days, how does it feel? Now that sort of question is not quite as crass as it sounds, initially sounds to someone of my age group. Uh, does it feel authentic? Does it feel good to be here? Does it feel alive? Uh, and can they feel anything of God or the Holy Spirit here? Uh, does it feel a fake? You know, like American TV evangelists. Yeah? What's my instinct about this lot? How does it feel? And that is answered by the health and the joy and the inclusiveness of the church as community. Uh, and you see how, how the way we can and should interface with people is spread out uh, over these years in my, my lifetime from the expert at the front who you know, does it all uh, to those Christians who are able to articulate their faith experience now to absolutely everybody uh, to, to create a church community that will feel good to join. Uh, and if it feels good to join, folk will join and catch the faith as they belong. So that's just something about initial questions. Um, and here's one of the ways in which we've been changing. Um, come to us. 
here we are, 10.30, on a Sunday morning, we do the unchanging ritual, this is church, come along uh, and experience it and join us, become like us. Uh, here's a, a, another way of thinking about reaching out to people, um, to boldly go where no church has gone before, uh, to uh, go to them mode. Uh, where are people? Can we actually help them to create an experienced church and church community where they are in new ways that are culturally appropriate to them? Uh, and we've been doing, actually, in the Church of England and other churches, some of both those things. Um, I'm not suggesting to you that come to us a sort of attraction model of church is wrong. In fact, I've just been saying I think it's great. Uh, if, the, if the church truly is an attractive community, it will attract people. Uh, you know, as a magnet attracts iron findings. Uh, but on the other hand, there are plenty of people whose culture is so remote from our, our, our semi-traditional church culture that we need to go to them. So it's, it, this is a question of both hand. Uh, and this is... Um, this is Archbishop Rowan's flying with two wings thing. You know, flying with two wings? Um, an aeroplane that's only got one wing, where's it going to go? What's it going to do? It's going to go... Smash. Um, we have a, an inherited church, traditional church wing, uh, and uh, what Rowan has been saying is we need to attach also a fresh expressions, uh, a new style of church wing. A church with two wings uh, will fly. Uh, if you take either wing away, we're in trouble. Uh, the two wings need each other. Uh, so none of this should be about competing uh, with, uh, with different forms of church. Uh, but rather having the mindset that different ways of doing church are complementary to each other. Uh, because our society is multicultural. So we need to reach as many people as possible by being multicultural ourselves. And of course one of the main criticisms of all that stuff I began with about post-modernity is that you can't generalise about people these days. Because you know, it's so complex. There are so many subcultures. Uh, and uh, so we've got to be pretty complex and into different subcultures ourselves. Though the message and the heart of what we're on about remains exactly the same. Uh, so um, I think in recent years we have been finding uh, ways of doing, new ways of doing evangelism that work in this new changing society. Um, now, uh, I've given an advert just now for the, I never thought I'd do for the um, Church of England newspaper. I now wish to give an advert, which I also thought I never ever would, for the Church Times, uh, uh, which I happened to pick up today uh, and found um, a wonderful back page interview and um, centre um, spread on Back to Church Sunday. Um, and the interview is with the uh, chap who. Um, markets back to church Sunday uh, and uh, he says very simply and very strongly on the back page of the church times no less than organ uh, that all this stuff about post-modernity and how difficult it is to communicate with people these days is just rubbish because people are people are people and they've all got a God-shaped hole in their hearts and the trouble is, the reason why we don't grow is that most Anglicans never ever invite somebody to come to church with them. It's as simple as that. If we invited people to come to church with us, some of them, not all, but some of them would actually come. And some who came would stay. But we don't invite them. So the church doesn't grow. Simple as that. Well, I happen to think there's a lot of truth in that. Uh, the reason he says we don't invite people is fear of rejection. We, we, fear, uh, we fear embarrassment you know, the, of the, the conversation of inviting someone. 
with fear rejection in the sense that they'll say, no, I don't want to go there, thank you very much. We fear that if they come, it'll just put them off. Because, you know, we know what our church is like. We're not so sure. <laughs> you know, if, if our next door neighbour actually came, it would set them alight, you know, in the right way. Uh, so all sorts of fears stop us. Uh, but... Um, can you think of anyone connected with the heart of the Christian faith who has suffered rejection? Uh, take up your cross and follow him. What's, what's wrong with a bit of feeling rejected for the sake of the gospel? Uh, so, back to church Sunday. It's one of the things that is clearly working. A day when we can we, we put set aside to really invite people. The problem is, why do we need to have a, one day in the year when we invite people to come to church? What's wrong with the other 51 Sundays of the year? Uh, so, there you go. The nurture courses. Uh, that's the major way in which people come to and sort out their Christian faith these days. You know, an Alpha course, a Start course, an Emmaus course, whatever it is we do. Uh, uh, that's appropriate to the age, because people start a long way further back than they used to. They need a course. Uh, need a long process and the courses work friendship just uh, um, we've been living in our village now for three years since I got out of being an archdeacon best thing I ever did okay uh, um, but uh, uh, what my wife has been steadily doing uh, is making genuine friendships um, uh, normally with, with folk who are half her age or less uh, with, with, with most of the young families in the village and she goes into the school, she's a retired teacher so she goes into the school twice, two mornings a week she's got to know every child in the village and she's got to know their parents uh, in all sorts of ways she's made a huge number of friendship links uh, and through that friendship she's now beginning to invite people to things and have conversations with people uh, so she's deliberately she doesn't uh, well she's just joined the PCC but until then she's taken on no jobs in the church at all she's doing friendship yeah? she's doing evangelism friendship uh, new ways of worshipping uh, you know, the, the great kaleidoscope of the different ways we have to worship these days means that the culture fits more people new times and days just the simple thing uh, that so many people are tied up on a Sunday morning uh, a huge proportion of the children of this country have no chance of going to church on a Sunday morning for one reason or another you know, it's, it's school and sport activities, it's dad's day Mum's working on the checkout at Tesco. Uh, they're in bed until 11. Whatever it is. Uh, so we're finding new times and days to offer worship opportunities. And the fresh expressions. Uh, the huge growth in the church at the moment is in Messy Church. And we've got someone doing a workshop on that uh, tomorrow. Um, and the explosive growth of Messy Church at the moment uh, is almost akin to the explosive growth of the Sunday School movement at the end of the 18th century. Uh, uh, we don't know how far it will go. It's very interesting. Um, as far as I can tell from rather patchy statistics, the team as a whole, if you add up your uh, attendance and membership numbers, uh, in recent years, since you know, 2002 or something, uh, there's no particular decline that I can see. Uh, sort of numbers total more than about the same. Uh, so you're not in a, in a situation of, of great church decline overall, so as I can see. Uh, and you have a will to reach new people and to grow. Therefore you will. You will. Um, here's a uh, just, uh, have I got time for this? Yes. Um, here's just, uh, this is from a piece of research. I had a questionnaire about a thousand Anglican churches in this country. Well, if you, if you include Wales as part of this country, it's Anglicans in England and Wales. Um, and uh, asked them a lot of questions and found out what their growth and shrinkage trends were. And distilled it all down 
to eight sort of types of change that lead to the growth of churches, that are associated with the growth of churches. Not every change is, uh, but it's very simple to demonstrate that churches that don't change tend to shrink and die, churches that do change tend to grow and flourish. So changes of the essence, but which changes? Here's eight. Uh, the first, uh, a most important and most widespread type of change that's associated with the growth of the church is the planting, the starting up of new congregations, new churches. Pretty obvious really, for 2,000 years all over the world, um, the Christian church has grown through planting new churches. It's what missionaries do, they plant churches. That's how we grow. Uh, now, for, for about a century, the Church of England had more or less, I think, mistaken how churches grow. We, we thought that church growth was about attracting more people to attend our existing event. Whereas actually, in the history of the church, is much more about being creating new events. How did the Church of England grow in the 19th century? It grew through planting Victorian church buildings, some of which are now millstones around our necks, others of which are thriving. Uh, but that's how the church grew in the 19th century. As it did in the, in the high medieval period, uh, where you know, medieval churches were built, planted, uh, that's how the church in this country has always grown, through planting new congregations. So it is today. And you see it throughout every diocese in the land. Um, so, inevitably, if you wish to grow as a team, you have to consider, do we plant new congregations in new ways and styles and times, and what should they be? Secondly, churches appear to grow when they make worship less formal and more relaxed. I mentioned that before. Uh, um, in, in keeping with the culture doesn't mean becoming happy clappy uh, uh, that's more f le less formal, more relaxed less stiff within whatever your church culture is, I don't mind what it is uh, but it's something about you know, the, the inner attitude um, uh, uh, there's a very um, thorough German research institute did this wonderful survey of growing churches around the world looking for common factors 50 different countries, hundreds of churches, and only discovered one really common factor in all growing churches around the world, and that was the presence of joy and laughter in the congregation. Yeah? Less stiff, more joy, more laughter. Yeah? Uh, so, you know, what's your, where's your church on that journey? Not, not, not to become um, frivolous, uh, some of the deepest things come with joy and laughter. Uh, there's depth as well as, you know, height implied there. Uh, uh, but that's, uh, that's the research. Thirdly, amazingly, um, where we provide better for children and young people, there are more children and young people. I think you've probably discovered that in your own experience over the years. Uh, where we don't provide well, we don't get good numbers. Whatever, whether it's traditional sort of Sunday schools, or whether it's this whole new, new style um, uh, provision, whatever it is, uh, the better the provision, the more the children and people and families there are around. Uh, and virtually every growing church in this country at the moment is growing from, from children and young people and families outwards. The heart of the growth is in families and children. Uh, um, growing churches grow younger shrinking churches shrink older now in order to reduce the average age we do not take out all the over 60s and shoot them you know that would reduce the average age but I'm not suggesting that uh, we are a key resource we oldies uh, but yet um, the um, uh, uh, the growth is likely to come in mo not every church but in most churches through attracting new generations in new ways. Uh, improving welcome and integration, learning to invite, learning to welcome, learning to integrate people into our communities better than we have in the past. Only 10 or 15% of the people who try out a church in this country finally succeed in joining, joining the church and staying and becoming part of the community. 
Uh, if we could make that 30% or 40%, churches throughout the land would be growing fast. Simple as that. Uh, so that's what the, um, my workshop will be about on Saturday. And uh, there's a bookstore over there and there's some Everybody Welcome course books there. Um, better quality, more variety in the music. The music's important. Uh, musicians are key people uh, for the growth of the church. Um, uh, some contemporaneity, uh, uh, but it all depends on the culture of the people we're reaching, we're trying to reach. The music culture should, should suit their culture. There's no one, you know, Anglican music culture. Yeah, you know what I mean? You know? Anglicanism is defined by this sort of use. No, no, no. The Church of England uh, is particularly distinctive as we hear for everybody. We're trying to reach the whole nation. And so we need to reach them musically uh, and in worship style as well as other ways. Um, lay involvement in leadership. Uh, the church will grow in the future as, as we think of the church as ourselves not as these peculiar people who have gone into the church, you know, you know the old phrase, he's gone into the church. In other words, he's got ordained. Well, he was in the church before, actually. Uh, the church is all of us. Uh, and where, uh, where church members are taking leadership roles, where they make the decisions and call the shots, uh, and leadership is spread over a wide number of people, then the church is likely to be growing. Now, the key, the key, it doesn't mean to say you sack the clergy, because they are key leaders even more than before. Uh, but they're not the people who are going to do all the leading. Uh, they are people who will help with strategy uh, and um, overall leadership uh, and, and help to develop the ministry of everybody else. It's not about the clergy's personal ministry, it's about the clergy helping us all to be ministers in the church. Uh, and where we crack that, we grow. Uh, small groups and pastoral care uh, are clearly key to the growth of churches, um, even more than in the past. Um, you may have noticed in your church probably not everyone comes every week. On average we're coming maybe once a fortnight now. So if you look at a congregation in a church, there's actually another congregation just as big who don't happen to be there this week. Uh, so how can you possibly keep tabs on anybody? When I was first ordained 30 odd years ago, I used to look around my congregation and think, oh, Where's Joyce? She's not here this week. I wonder if she's all right. A bit while pretending to sing the first hymn, you know, this is where, you know, who's here this week? And you, you, you can notice who wasn't here, because everyone came every week, or so I thought. Uh, and, and there was a matter of thought, well, you can't do that now, can you? Not if you're clergy. Not only are the people not there every week, you aren't there every week, because you've got four churches of your own anyway. So, you know, who is there? Nobody's there every week to keep tabs on people. Has to be done in a different way. Small groups, pastoral care networks. Uh, most people leave churches, not they don't intend to leave, leave, they just drift slowly away. And no one seems to notice. No one seems to care. No one follows them up. Uh, so, when we improve on that, we tend to grow. Because the growth of the church is just as much about as it were, closing the back door and uh, making this place so good that no one ever wants to leave. No one, you, know, you can't leave without being loved back. Uh, so you close the back door as well as opening wide the front door. It's the two together. Improves the buildings, do register. Uh, if you improve the building for missional reasons, the church will tend to grow. What are the toilets like? Uh, if, um, uh, if a young mum comes with a four year old for the first time looking for a Sunday school uh, what's she going to see? is she going to see you know, health and safety hazards for the precious little one and never come again or is she going to see something that's really good uh, and where she feels secure and comfortable so there are eight changes uh, which seem to lead to church growth. If we develop and change in those eight ways, we tend to grow. That's what the experience suggests. So, plenty of hope. 
Uh, not if we just repeat what we've already done and expect a different outcome. You know that definition of madness? Yeah? Uh, of repeating what you've always done and expecting a different outcome. So we do need vision for change uh, if we're going to reap a harvest of hope. And it's a challenging situation that we find ourselves in, we know about that. Uh, vision is about looking and seeing clearly. Um, we need to have a clear look at our situation. You know, how are we compared with five or ten years ago? Let's be honest about this. Uh, you know, what's, what's got better, what's got weaker? Ourselves, what are our energy and ability levels like? Who are we? What can we achieve? And how much energy do we have? Healthy churches do a few things well. You don't exhaust ourselves by trying to do more than we're capable of. And doing everything badly. That's a bad idea. Uh, so, um, uh, adjusting what we do as a church to the ability and energy levels we have is quite something. Uh, has God changed? Is he limited? Don't think so. Uh, so we have unlimited uh, divine resources, even if the human resources are limited. Um, if you want a biblical story, an image, remember Nehemiah, uh, you know, there he was, cupholder to the king over um, in Iraq, and uh, he sees what's needed, he hears what Jerusalem is like, the walls are broken down, it's a mess, the gates have been burnt, uh, and, and he, he weeps, he hates what he's, he knows is the current situation, but he has vision for what it can be like. And he has the courage to go and ask, ask the king, can I go and sort it out on your behalf, please, king? Uh, uh, and and he can, he's got the vision, the clarity of mind, to know he has to have safe passage, he needs to have a letter from the king to, for the timber to rebuild the, 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 the gates, the uh, temple, Jerusalem temple and all the rest of it, uh, and, and he can see that a rebuilt Jerusalem will honour God and transform his people. Uh, so in a very difficult situation, uh, the visionary knew what needed doing, did it, uh, and saw the results. Um, there's something about keeping our feet on the ground, about vision, and also having our head in the clouds at the same time, if you see what I mean. Can we manage both at once? Can we both have manage to have great faith in the God who can do anything, uh, and also great realism about our situation? So that you know, we, we, we work realistically uh, in, 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 in both on the ground and in the stratosphere. Uh, and how does change come? Well, here's three things we need. Dissatisfaction with the present, remember Nehemiah. Vision for how things might be in the future. Uh, and the Holy Spirit on our side. Uh, dissatisfaction with the present. Vision for how things might be. The Holy Spirit on our side. Do you have any holy dissatisfaction? What is it? What do you think? Oh, that could be better. Yeah. We let the Lord down in our church this way. What's, uh, uh, what would you be really embarrassed about if you did ask your next door neighbour and they did amazingly say, yes, I'll come with you to church? What would, what would trouble you? <laughs> uh, when you woke up Sunday morning, I've got to take him to church today. Oh dear. What's your holy dissatisfaction? What vision do you have? What can you see in your mind's eye uh, for your church? But, wow, wouldn't it be amazing if it was like this? I can see it. Uh, where do you sense the Holy Spirit is leading you? Uh, what's your vision? Um, hope is a well-grounded expectation that vision can become reality. Our hope is in Christ. Uh, that's, that's the power source for everything. Uh, uh, but it's also on experience. Uh, as we you know, I knock around the Church of England and in other countries, I know how many cha churches are changing, growing, flourishing, uh, being wonderful uh, foretastes of heaven. 
uh, and Christian communities uh, in our contemporary world. And I'm sure, having met you already, that there's at least big elements of that in your own church communities. So what is there in your recent past or current situation that gives you grounds for hope where you are? What, what are the hopeful things uh, uh, exactly where you are? Um, so there's some uh, questions uh, and uh, yes, we've got ten minutes. So I wonder if you might like to sort of buzz with neighbours for, for five or seven minutes or something. Uh, you might want to say, well, the thing that really struck me about, he went on a long time, didn't he? But at least there was one thing that was interesting, and it was this. Or you might like to um, respond to some of those questions at the end about your holy dissatisfaction, your vision, your sense of where the Spirit's leading you. Uh, or maybe that last question, what in your current situation?